welcome everyone. Um, I can see the participant the participant number ticking up as people join this demos, experiments, and Q and A session today. Um, thank you for joining, um, and hopefully you will find lots of relevance, interest, and things to ask questions about um, over the over the course of the session. I said I'm just going to give a few more minutes um, in case anyone else um, is trying to join, find the link, all of those kind of things, um, and then we'll get started. Okay, so let's let's go to the the next slide. Um, so again, just um, for some of you who've joined the earlier sessions today, um, you'll have heard our notes, um, but just to make you aware of Crossref's code of conduct. Um, if you are on, um, if you are on Mastodon or X, then you can join the discussion. We'd welcome you to do so um, on those platforms. Um, but I think probably the most effective thing for this session is if you've got questions, um, use the Q&A box to pose those to our, our presenters. We're going to take questions for each of the presenters um, after, after each of their sections um, so that they're still fresh in your mind. And we will share the, the slides and recordings um, afterwards. Next slide. Um, the Reminder, um, you've got, I think, around two hours left. So if you haven't voted for the 2023 um, board slate, then our ballots close pretty soon. But if you wish to submit a vote or change your proxy vote, then um, then let Lucy know in her emails in this. So um, we've got a really good, um, interesting slate of candidates this year. So um, part of being a member of Crossref is having the capacity to be able to vote and make sure that our board is as representative as possible of you and your communities and your needs. So we'd really encourage you to do that. Next slide. So I'm going to start by introducing the session. Um, as I said, this is product demos, experiments, and questions um, for those who are willing to, um, to present. I would say the aim of this session is to give a view across the things that we are at the early stages of exploring and working on, both from the product and development teams, and also um, you'll see strong representation from the, from the labs team at Crossref as well. Um, we're gonna give some hints and tips for using our APIs um, ones that you're probably very familiar with or would like to get more familiar with and newer ones as well. And then external integrations with our um, with Crossref from our colleagues at the Public Knowledge Project um, for whom it's very early. So, uh, so thank you, Eric. Um, each demo will last for around 15, 20 minutes and we should have time for questions for our panelists. So, um, Luis and I are going to keep an eye on the Q&A and try to make sure that those get to the right people at, um, at the right time. So our first demo is, um, is currently under development. So again, we've got for a couple of these things are under active development. We've tried to step away for them and not from them and not touch them for the, for the purposes of the demos today. But as any of you who've done a live demo know, they can be all sorts of fun. So um, kudos to my, my colleagues. Um, but our first demo is of our currently under development registration form for, um, for journal content. Um, Lena Stoll will share a sneak peek of the work that we've been doing to create a simple user interface to make it easier for members to register good quality journal article metadata. Um, so over to you, Lena. Thanks very much, Rachel. We're actually starting out quite safe. I'm not doing a live demo. Um, I just have screenshots and slides so everyone can relax for the next 10, 15 minutes and then it gets really exciting when people start doing things live. Um, yeah, great to be here today. For the many of you who don't know me yet, 
Um, as Rachel said, my name is Lena. I joined the product team at Crossref over the summer. Um, I'm based in beautiful grey Berlin, Germany, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit today about the work that we've been doing to develop, as Rachel said, a simple user interface or UI to allow members to register journal articles um, without having to touch an XML file. Um, I say we have been doing this work, which is quite generous uh, for myself because I've only been here a few months. And actually on the product side, uh, most of this is the result of a lot of work by my colleague, Sarah Bowman, who many of you might know better. Um, but I've taken on this work because she recently went on maternity leave. Um, so just in case you're wondering why there's a new face talking about this. Um, and on the tech side, shout out to Patrick Vale, I know you're watching. Um, okay, so anyway, <laughs> what we're doing here is basically an extension of the concept behind the new grants registration form that we released, I think, towards the end of last year that uh, some of you might have uh, used before or seen Sarah demo in the past. So a lot of this might be familiar if you're um, if you're familiar with that tool. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge that some people in the audience might be thinking, um, aren't there already multiple ways of registering records, especially journal articles? Um, and it's 10 points to you if you recognize all of these options I've represented on this slide, and if you can name them all. Um, we have our trusty old web deposit form that you can see at the top right. We have a uh, metadata manager. We have uh, a plugin for OJS for those that use that platform to manage their journal articles. We have an admin console um, where you can upload XML files if you're able to create them. And then, of course, there's the option of depositing XML in an automated way to our APIs using HTTPS post, which is represented on the bottom right. And that is, of course, um, the most kind of reliable, scalable, efficient way of registering metadata. But we do know that um, today the majority of our members are either institutions or they're small publishers, and not everyone runs an XML-first workflow. Not everybody even has the technical resources to or know how to create XML in an automated way and deposit it. So we do want to offer uh, these user interfaces that allow everyone to at least uh, perform all of the most essential tasks that you need to do to be a good Crossref citizen. Um, but the goal isn't and can't really be to uh, represent absolutely everything that you could do with direct calls to our APIs through a user interface, because with if you're familiar with our metadata schema and the sheer complexity behind everything that you can in principle register with us, then you'll understand that that's uh, not really realistic to do in a form that people still have a fighting chance of actually using. But that's just an aside. Um, getting off my uh, virtual soapbox, I guess the main point of this slide is just to say all of these different routes, all of these different roads ultimately lead to the same database and to the same APIs, so why would we bother creating yet another tool for depositing? Um, well, if you go to the next slide, um, actually each one of the tools that we've built so far that work around the requirement to um, work with, a with XML files directly, all of them uh, serve their own little niche of use cases. And you have to be pretty familiar with the Crossref tool ecosystem to kind of understand which one is the right one to use for which purpose. Um, and each of our tools also has its own kind of specific limitations. So for example, Metadata Manager is very complex technically. And for that reason, it has a number of bugs and issues that we're aware of that we've never been able to kind of fully address. Um, the web deposit form is a little bit awkward to use and it doesn't cover all record types and so on and so on. Um, and all of this together kind of leads to a confusing user experience for uh, those members who are trying to deposit their metadata manually. And it's also quite inefficient for us to have to maintain all these different 
tools in parallel. They're all in different code bases. Um, if we make a change to a metadata schema, for example, we have to then, um, as a result of that, make multiple changes in multiple places to, to reflect that in all of our tools. Um, and so what we've been building here since uh, since we started with the grants registration form last year and now with this general article registration form is different because it is being built in um, what we call a schema driven way. And by that, I just mean that we're, we're creating the interface, the form that you actually enter the metadata into um, in an indirect way from the schema itself. So it takes the schema as an input and then creates a form out of it, which means that if there's a change to the schema, it's much, much easier and much faster for us to reflect that in the actual interface. Um, and it's also an interesting proof of concept for the wider community to show that it is possible to build your own interfaces in that way that suit your specific needs. Um, because as I already said earlier, we will likely never be able to build um, the ultimate one single tool that um, is usable that it, that also allows you to do absolutely everything that you could do if you were talking to the XML API directly. Um, and so the idea is that if we build a unified set of forms like the grants deposit form and like now the new journal article form, um, eventually we'll be able to replace uh, some of the tool or tools that we know aren't really serving our community in the way that they could. Um, I'm talking specifically now about Metadata Manager, which if you've used it lately, you've seen the little banner at the top, you'll know that we've been planning to deprecate that for a while now. And if you want to read more about the reasoning behind that decision and um, why we're doing what we're doing, then there's a blog post linked on this slide that Sarah wrote a little while ago called Next Steps for Content Registration. Um, and we're also building all of our new tools in a way that they are uh, easily automatically translatable. That's a process called localization um, and that they can also be used by users with disabilities. Um, okay, so that's the preamble. If you go to the next slide, um, I just want to show you a few screenshots. Um, I hope they're not too small on your screens. Um, just of the current state of the prototype of this form that we've been wor working on. It's still at a very early stage as uh, Rachel kind of gave you a little disclaimer at the beginning and a bit of a warning, but I just want to show you, just give you a little bit of a flavor of what I'm talking about. So if you've used the grants registration form in the past, or if you've seen it, then a lot of the kind of design of this interface is going to look quite familiar to you. Um, we're deliberately keeping it very simple. So sorry, these screens aren't particularly shiny or colorful. Um, but we're focusing on the uh, most important, the most widely used fields in the metadata schema for journal articles. And um, just again, not every little thing that the schema in theory allows for in an XML file can be represented in a form without making it so complex that it doesn't work for any, anyone anymore. Um, but we're focusing on the most important fields just to make sure that we can meet the needs, especially of those types of members who we know can't afford to programmatically generate XML and who, know, who need these kinds of tools. Um, in terms of how the tool is used, we've conceived of it as a kind of wizard um, that guides you through the sequence of necessary steps one by one. You can see a little stepper at the top. Um, and also anytime that you enter something or you try to complete a step, the tool will validate for you whether what you've just entered makes any sense and whether it fits what's allowed in the schema. Um, that's just because, of course, anytime you make a tool that's used by human beings, um, there's a capacity for people making typos or copy and paste errors, especially with such a toilsome task as registering dozens of journal articles by hand. If you've done it before, I'm sure you've made some copy and paste errors. And it's a lot more costly if you have to correct those after the fact. So it's very important to validate inputs early on, which is what we're doing. Um, you can see an example of this actually on the screenshot in red um, at, you know, towards the bottom because I've entered an invalid DOI. Um, and also, if you're a very keen observer, you might have seen at the top right, there is a language switcher button. Um, this is what I mentioned earlier about localization. Um, 
a really important thing that we want to do with any of the new tools that we're building is to make sure that especially with those languages that we know um, a lot of our members are much more comfortable with than English, they can be used in those other languages. And the form can also be navigated using your keyboard. Um, so we're designing it to be accessible enough that it can be used by anyone in the community who actually needs it. Um, yeah, so if you look at the stepper at the top, uh, you can see that the form asks you first for information on the journal, and then it goes down to the issue level, and then finally the article itself that you're registering. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the issue screen. Um, there's not going to be that many surprises there for you in terms of the fields that are represented. Um, you might have noticed already at the top that uh, several titles can be entered, both for the journal and for the issue, and then also for the article. That's just because we support multiple languages for titles. Um, yeah, and like I said, we're focusing on the key metadata fields and those that are going to be highest value for um, making a high quality record and also for the people who use our metadata to have a chance to then discover that content. So that's the issue. And then if you go one slide further, um, you'll see the article level and you'll be able to see that in this example, I've given the article a couple of different titles in different languages. Um, I don't speak so many, so this had to do. Um, and there is also a raw lookup already built in. Um, if you look closely, you can see for the contributor, um, you can, uh, if you start entering the uh, affiliation, um, the tool will find the uh, unique identification in the raw database for it. Um, that's something that was quite a crowd pleaser in the grant registration form. Um, and there are more of those kinds of, I guess, quality of life improvements um, for using the tool that we know already we'll definitely need to or want to offer in the form once we actually have it go live for members to use. Um, just right now, not all of them are there yet because we've been focusing very much on uh, getting a prototype into a state as quickly as possible that we can share it with all of you and with the wider community and uh, get some feedback. Uh, if you go one more slide ahead, we'll get to the fourth step. Um, at the end of the whole registration process, if again, if you know the grants registration form, you'll, um, you'll know what this looks like. Um, we'll be able to give the user a JSON file download of the record that they've just created. Um, the XML actually doesn't visibly get involved at any point. That's just created in the background by the tool automatically and deposited in much the same way that it would be deposited if the user directly used our XML API. Um, the this JSON file, so that's one another one of the things that I said we know we'll we'll want to do um, because it makes a big difference in how useful the tool is, is that um, we will allow for users to be able to load those JSON files back into the form later and then make changes, which is something that is already the case on the grant registration form. Um, just for this very first prototype, we're focusing just on the initial registration part so that we can um, test that with the community. Um, but we know that editing records after the fact, um, especially for journal articles, is something that uh, people use Metadata Manager for a lot. Yeah, so that's just a note on that. Um, and actually on that topic, if you go to the next slide, oh, are some people having issues not seeing slides? I'm just gonna pretend I didn't read that and keep talking if it's working for most yeah, people. Yeah, I think, I think I we're okay, but we'll have a look. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, since I've already used the word soon, um, Obviously, next questions are what's coming next? What are the kinds of timelines? Um, like I said at the beginning, um, we weren't quite ready and confident enough to uh, to do this live yet and go into the actual prototype and enter things and uh, show you how it reacts. So I took the safe route out of taking screenshots. Sorry about that. Um, and we can't quite share a link to the prototype yet either for you to play around with yourselves for the same reason, but like I said, um, the goal is to get there as quickly as possible. 
So we're just uh, putting some finishing touches on it. Um, and it's, again, a very early version, so don't expect to see it in production tomorrow just yet. Um, but of course, we'll keep our community updated as we make more progress. Um, we're going to be iterating over the coming weeks and months on um, early initial feedback that we're going to be getting both internally and then from um, from some key members of our community. So I just actually I should say thanks at this point to those of you who are Crossref ambassadors who have already volunteered to um, to help us test the prototype. We'll be getting in touch with you very soon. Um, there are also some people who have volunteered on the community forum already in the past to be involved in this process, which is great. Um, and then in terms of uh, some future next steps, uh, again, if you've used Metadata Manager recently or not even not so recently, you will have seen the little yellow banner um, that tells you it's going to be deprecated. It still says 2023. Right now is the date of sunsetting it, but we don't want to rush this while um, it's still needed because what we're building out as a minimum viable version of this new tool, that's what the MVP on the slide means, uh, minimum viable product for those who aren't so deep in the uh, tech rabbit hole. Um, yeah, it's we we don't want to rush this, so I'm, I put 2024 on here because that's probably more realistic, but um, the idea is that uh, once we've got uh, once we've a bit more formally reached out for community feedback, like we always do with, with such an important project, um, and we've iterated on that, and we're getting confident that we have a viable version of this tool, um, we will be able to put the ghost of Metadata Manager, I guess, a bit of a Halloween theme here for you, um, to rest finally and uh, and look to the future. So... Yeah, if you are um, one of those people who really resonate with uh, with what I've been talking about and who maybe currently uses Metadata Manager or even the web deposit form to register your journal article, then you want to help us shape this new thing, then um, absolutely feel free to get in touch with me. I think the next slide will tell you how to do that. Um, or not. Okay, there was supposed to be a thank you slide with my email address on it. But... Um, I'll make sure to uh, to add that after the fact, I guess. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, we can put it into the chat as well. Yeah, it's it's also pretty easy to guess our email addresses if you know one of them, I think. Um, but yeah, but I also wanted to say that the, um, the community forum is always also a great place to be if you want to stay up to date with what everyone is doing at Crossref. Um, the, one of the first places that you'll find out when there's news or something to test or give input on. So um, shout out for the community forum. And uh, we'll put my email address in the chat. Look forward to speaking to some of you about this some more. And for now, I think that's it for me. Uh, oh, thanks, Jenny. Okay, there it is already. Uh, thanks uh, to you, Rachel, I guess. Lena, there's a question for you in the Q&A. Um, yes, okay, we have a question that says, given the drive in Crossref to get publishers to register reference lists, will there be an option to upload reference lists either in their entirety for passing or as a list of DOIs only? Um, that's a very good question. Of course, we know that um, references are a very, very important uh, metadata type and also one that we've been kind of pushing our members when we discuss their participation reports with them um, or that kind of thing to, to really consider investing in. So we know that we'll want to be representing that in this uh, in this tool in some way. We haven't really uh, made the definitive decision yet on what the best way of doing that is. Um, if there will be uh, some way to uh, use our uh, simple text query that we tool that we have to to get DOIs for references if you don't have them yet or um, if it's better to do them the other way around. I don't think that I would I have a definitive answer on this yet. Um, but that's exactly why we are trying to um, get this out for community testing and feedback as quickly as possible so that we can nail these sorts of things down. But that's the kind of thing that we don't want to make um, a decision on too early on before we know what's actually most valuable. So if you think uh, you have input on that, then um, 
get in touch with me for sure. Um, and I think we let's, I can see there are other questions, but I want to, um, and I think some advice yeah. as well. I want to keep us moving and jump onto the next presentation just so that we don't run over time. Um, but we can answer those in the Q&A as well and come back to them if we've got time at the end, I would suggest. Is that all right? Perfect, thanks. Yeah, it's not really a question anyway, I think, so I'll just respond. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, next up we have Eric Hansen from the Public Knowledge Project, um, or PKP, who's going to demonstrate the latest um, Crossref plugin um, in OJS 3.4, the DOI workflow has been completely rewritten, addressing usability issues and providing a better overall user experience. So with so many of our members using OJS extensively, um, these improvements are really timely. And thanks to the team for sharing them with us and giving us the, the opportunity towards the end of um, last year to test them out. Um, Eric, can we hand over to you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen if I can. It does not look like I'm able to share my screen. Would you like to have another go? Yes. Oh no. And um, perhaps really typical Zoom uh, live demo context. I've recently reset my computer and I unfortunately do have to briefly log off of Zoom and restart Zoom. I'm terribly sorry about this. Um, do you want to, um, what we can do is we can, we can tweak the order a little bit if you want to leave and then rejoin. Yeah. That I think a perfect. couple of us have been hit with Zoom updates this morning, which is, of course, another um, another variable in all of this. So we'll keep a lookout for you, add you back in. Um, and and I think that will work. Um, Martin Rittman, if you're happy to go next. Yeah, no problem. I can jump in. Um, so, yeah, let me share my screen and hope that hope that all the uh, to work. Um, yep, so, yeah, works. this is awesome. Good. Um, so yeah, this is a presentation about a new API endpoint that we that we have. Um, and I, I'm going to demonstrate it via a, a, a Jupyter notebook. Um, I realize this is in Python, and some of you might be might be not familiar with Python. Don't worry, I will explain uh, and point out the, the the most relevant bits as we as we go through. But basically, this is looking at different ways that we can uh, that we can look at Crossref um, metadata. Um, so I'm going to talk about relationships. Firstly, how you uh, can get hold of relationships and uh, where uh, how we will combine those into one endpoint in the future. Um, so if you are familiar with Python, all I'm doing here is using the requests library to query APIs. Here's the endpoints. If you'd like to try this out, um, uh, then then you can go to to this uh, this URL, which which has the the endpoints, and I'll give you a few more pointers at, at the end for that. Um, I've also, um, I'm not running this off a Colab notebook, but I have a Colab notebook and I'll share the link for that at the end um, as, as well. Um, so yeah, we're just going to start the, the notebook with a few useful functions, which are to show you the URL that we're querying. Um, we'll see that in a moment. Um, and then this is this this is the function that does the, the work um, and it, it, it um, queries some URL and it expects a JSON uh, output. So this is uh, JSON is the the format of the data that that gets returned from our APIs. Um, so as we, we're talking about just now, very timely um, references are are very important, and many of our members send us references. Um, and what we can uh, what we what we do at Crossref is display those to a works endpoint. So each item has an entry, um, and you can query the works endpoint. Um, Using using this uh, URL, so you know api.crossref.org slash uh, works, and then we have in in there this filter which say, says does this item have references or not? Just give me the ones with references. 
Um, and just to give you examples, we have you know eight references for this DOI, 89 for this. I don't know what this this is. Maybe it's a book or something, but 424 references. I, I feel sorry for the, the poor production people who, who have to go through all of those. Um, what do these actually look like in, in JSON? Um, well, this is the uh, th this is the JSON list of references. I've just pulled out the the, the reference part of of, uh, of the response, uh, and we can see that this DOI here is citing a number of, of of things. And this is this is one of them that I'm highlighting here. It has a DOI. It also has the title, the authors, um, and we've got this unstructured reference as, as as well. You don't have to pass references to put them into our, um, uh, to, to deposit them with, with us. Uh, you can have just unstructured text like here. You don't even need a DOI. We will try and match that for you. Um, so you can see just kind of, you know, more examples uh, with similar kind of information. So that's, that's references. There's another way that you can add uh, links between outputs in, in slightly um, more descriptive ways. Um, and that's using the relationships uh, part of our schema. And um, again, I'm going to query the works endpoint, going to query the same endpoint. Instead of saying has references, we says has has relations. Um, do, does it have a relationship? And that's that's run nice and quickly, thankfully. It's just always, always risky doing a live demo. But anyway, here's just one example. Uh, and we have um, here we have the type of relationship. Um, that we just pulled the relationships part out of the uh, the, the JSON response, um, and then it says uh, it says what the relationship is to as well. And this is just an ide uh, a, an identifier. It says it's a DOI. You can add other types of identifier in there as well. Uh, and we say who it's asserted by. So subject means that it's asserted by the um, the the member that deposited this metadata. If it said object, then it would have been asserted by the member who deposited the metadata for the related item so it's you know there's two sides to a relationship and one um this happens in life as well but you know one one person says one thing one person says another thing um, and as you know they don't always agree and um, here's just a few more examples so we have reviews we have comments um i think these are mostly reviews this is one with a uh, an article with a preprint um uh, and we can see that you know some of these were asserted by the the member who deposited the 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 object uh, the the metadata. Some of them were asserted by, um, for example, this one was asserted by the the member who deposited the comment and said it comments on on this. And we match up in our um, as has already been mentioned. We we match up the reverse relationship here. So that's kind of nice. But you might notice that this output looks very different from what we saw before with the references. Different kind of of metadata available. So I mentioned briefly that you can link to things outside of Crossref. We have a project called Event Data, which where we go and look for uh, relationships um, from Crossref DOIs that are kind of you know mentioned around the web. So, for example, on Wikipedia, hypothesis annotations. Uh, we look on on Reddit and just kind of blogs and websites, um, and. Um, I'll, I'll just show you one example here. Um, we're looking at specifically at Wikipedia. Um, now the, the eagle-eyed among you might notice that um, the event data API is being closed down from the end of next month. This is because we will continue to collect events, um, but we want to be able to, we want to focus on the new endpoint, the relationships endpoint, um, as you'll, which you'll see in a, in a moment. Um, and the best use of our resources is to stop is is to stop with event data, put all of event data into the relationships endpoint, um, and make that usable for 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 the users that that are doing that. So if you are using event data, um, uh, you'll want to look at the um, at the relationships endpoint um, as as uh, yeah very, in the next few weeks. Um, so this is an example of an event, and you'll see again it looks very different to the references. It looks different to the relationship uh, metadata that we saw, um, but essentially we've got the same kind of information. So we've got an identifier for the subject. In this case, it's a URL a Wikipedia page. We have an identifier for the object, which is a Crossref DOI, and we say how these two things are linked together. Um, 
and, and this is as, as, as a reference. So you've seen here, there's three different ways that we essentially deliver the same metadata. Um, and, you know, we've been looking uh, a, a great deal in the, you know, in the past few, few months and years at the research nexus. Um, and that doesn't really preference any kind of item or any kind of relationship. And so we said, well, why don't we reflect that in our APIs and provide all of the relationships that we know about through a single endpoint and in the same format? And this is uh, what we've been been building um, for a while now. Um, and as I said at the, at the beginning, this is the uh, this is the URL. Um, and I'm just looking for you know a single day. So we've got uh, we've got a number of, of of filters, time filters, for example, on the on the output. And you see on this day, there were about 2.4 million relationships uh, found. I'm not going to show you all of those, but this is just one of them. Um, and again, we've, we've tried to pare it down to the, the minimum kind of useful information. Uh, and we'd love feedback as to whether this is sufficient, whether we need more, whether we need less, um, and what would make this useful for, uh, for you to use. And so we have a subject. So this relationship comes from a Crossref DOI. Uh, and in this case, it's going to um, an organization. Um, so this I can tell you because I've, I've looked at this way too often is, is Wiley. And it says that this DOI was published by Wiley essentially. Um, and this information was asserted instead of just saying subject or object or a, or a word, we're using a raw identifier for Crossref. Um, so basically Crossref is asserting that Wiley is, is permitted to uh, to manage the metadata record of, of this DOI. Um, so in the first instance, we are focusing on um, data citations, which have been mentioned quite a number of times already. So I'm, I'm really happy to, to have heard that. It kind of, hopefully, uh, I, I don't need to give too much motivation for why data citations are interesting and, and important. Um, and again, we're going to query the relationships endpoint. We're going to look for things that have the type data set, uh, and we're just going to look for a, a single day and see what we um, what we find. And we find actually there were 100 and 147 data citations uh, or um, are found on this day. Now, um, this what this means is uh, the subject type data set, this is with a capital D is the um, is is used by data site. So these are actually not data citations deposited by Crossref members. These are data citations that have been deposited by data site members. They very kindly pass that information on to us, and we're able to make it available um, through the uh, through through our endpoints. And you know we do that reciprocally as well. Um, and let's just have a look at the at the output there. So we can see, uh, you know, there's various relationship types which are used. So you know this this uh this this doi here so this one here is is metadata for this crossref doi um this data site doi um is posted content which is um uh, sorry yes this this is a crossref doi which is posted content um and um is cited by uh this this uh data site doi which is in zenodo and and so on and, and so forth um so of course, I mean, I, I I don't know whether doing a live presentation on this makes make sense, but you know, the idea is that this is machine readable. And if you want to look up more information about a, a DOI, you can just go to our works endpoint and 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 retrieve the the metadata for that. This is really focused on the on the um relationships. Um looks like I should have uh, shortened the output for this one. Anyway, um you can um this is this is one i'm not convinced is going to work because this query has been taking rather a long time um at, at the moment but uh you can query for everything which has been registered by data site um uh and um the the output i've i've done i've done a short uh kind of put the output here but you know you this is this is the output that you will see but just to to show you you know more kinds of queries that you can make and um so I'm not quite sure how I'm doing for time here, but I'll uh, carry on. For, uh, yeah, we can we can let people get to the and what else um, in the. But yeah, just a, about a minute left. Be great. OK, fine. Yeah. So uh, just very, very quickly, then you can you don't have to look at a DOI. You can look at ORCIDs. 
you can look at um, organizations. Uh, you could there's funding metadata in here. Um, so yeah, this is, says the orchid was an author of, of that. Um, this um, we can see that Carga has, has deposited fifty thousand uh, uh, references, and you know we've got funding information in here as well. Uh, sorry to kind of blast through that very quickly, but I will put this um, I will put this collab uh, notebook link um, into the the chat, and uh, you, you can have a look and um, have a look by yourself. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for for your attention. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, there's the link to the notebook for anyone to have a look at. I am really conscious of time. Um, maybe one question, um, Luis, do you want to take and then we can get to the other ones in the chat? Sure, oh, all right, perfect. There is one question maybe you can answer very quickly. Yeah, so yeah, is event data going to be available in relationships API from day one? Um, the answer is um, actually probably not. There will be a, a gap. We have committed to making all of event data available by the end of January 2024. Um, but we, we, you know, event data for those of you who've been using it has been unstable for quite some time, and we've decided that it's better to focus on something new and stable. Um, and there may be a, a gap in which some events are not available. We've really focused on data citation because we know that that's a very important use case and all of data cite, um, uh, all, all of the data citations that we know about will be available um, from day one. The rest we will add um, gradually over, over time. That's great, thank you. And I said you can, um, there's a few other questions in the, the yeah, chat I'll that you can this. pick up. Thank you. Eric, should we try again? Yes, fingers crossed. Thank you so much for moving things around for no me. No worries. Yep, we can see your screen. Perfect. OK, so jumping back to a few minutes ago, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, Open Journal Systems uh, or OJS, that I'd give just a brief uh, overview of what it is. Um, it's an open source journal management and publishing platform. Um, it en encompasses uh, submission workflow, peer review, as well as the production workflow. And it's currently in use by more than 30,000 journals uh, worldwide. Um, and today I'd like to share with you a little bit about the new DOI workflow in the latest release 3.4 which came out in June 9th. But in order to provide a little bit of context around that, I'd first like to show you a little bit from the previous version, 3.3, set up why these changes are so big and helpful, especially for people who are managing lots and lots of DOIs. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with OJS, this is the home screen view for and an editor would log in. Um, I just want to show an example of uh, what some of the pain points are when dealing with the DOIs in the previous version. So to start with, one of the major ones are around DOI creation. Uh, it's spread out throughout many different places throughout the application. So for example, if we were to pull up this published article, um, currently I only have uh, article DOIs enabled, but I'll show an example of where all of those would go. So this is the kind of publication tab for a, a published submission. Um, the article DOI would be under here, under the identifiers tab. If you have a galley DOI, it would be separately under here, and the issues would be yet under a different tab entirely. Um, another pain point that this brings about is you can see from this big red banner, this version has been published and cannot be edited. Um, this often happens that an article will be published. This is especially prominent in, with preprints before a DOI has necessarily been assigned to it. And this has previously been impossible in OJS and encourages bad practices around things like unpublishing it to update the metadata then republishing it. Highlight one other pain point here. 
is around the previous DOI pattern. And this is what we call the default DOI suffix generation in OJS 3.3 and previous. If you come to assign the DOI, you'll see this warning, which says you cannot generate a DOI until this publication has been assigned to an issue. To just quickly show at a glance what that entails, go into the DOI settings for this version. And in OJS 3.3 and earlier, we use a pattern-based suffix generation, which does contain semantic information about the item in question. So the most common one is for articles, and it includes information about the issue, the volume number, IDs inherent to it from OJS itself. And this is often very problematic because a DOI cannot be assigned to an item until it has been assigned to an issue. And this is often very problematic because maybe an item shouldn't be assigned to an issue yet, but you would like to have a DOI, right? If you shuffled around and you want to be able to assign a DOI, it's part of the pre-production. So it's a little bit of background on some of the kind of pain points of DOI um, generation. Which brings us to OJS 3.4 and the same view here, just as a starting point. Um, so I'll do a quick walkthrough of the process of setting things up, as well as show some of the highlights of the new workflow. Um, so first of all, you'll notice DOIs are featured very prominently on the sidebar here. And so one of the major changes is that DOIs are now a core part of the application. Previously, they were a separate plugin, which kind of limited the amount of integration, deep integration into the application that was possible. And the Crossref plugin and any of the other registration agency plugins are still plugins, but this new architecture allows them to be more deeply integrated into the application. And I hope as I go through some of that today, you'll be able to see some of that. Um, to start with, show you what some of the settings look like, just to provide some context. DOIs can be enabled or disabled as part of the distribution workflow kind of globally here. Um, next up, it's very similar to previous versions, items with DOIs. Currently, I only have articles selected. Um, this also varies across the different um, software applications that PKP makes for one for monographs and one for preprints, but it's roughly the same idea. One new thing here in particular is that by default, anything that OJS can create a DOI for is possible here. Of note is the article galleys, um, and this is usually in the most default context of published PDF. Crossref, for the Crossref plugin, this option is disabled. And this can be configured for other registration agencies if, say, they didn't take issue DOIs, for instance. And potentially more applicable is for monographs if different services do or do not take chapter DOIs or the, don't have the capability to distinguish between those types of things. And I'll show what that looks like here. Um, next big thing is the automatic DOI assignment. Um, the philosophy around this was just to be able to generate DOIs as early as possible so that they're there as part of the production process, part of the um, layout process. This can either be done on reaching the copy editing stage, which essentially means as early as possible, on publication, or never, in other words, manually. Um, and when we looked at the pain point from OJS 3.3, uh, what that Kind of has bearing on for this is that you needed to have assigned things to an issue. That is no longer the case. Um, the default suffix generation now creates a unique eight character suffix. Um, and this is a pattern we took from inspiration from a, a data site tool that would create an eight character suffix and it includes a checksum digit. So it can be checked programmatically to make sure there are no typos in a similar way to ISSNs or ISBNs. Um, so one of the other big wins is because it's a unique eight character suffix, it does not contain any semantic information and there is no temptation for editors or journal managers to want to use 
the DOIs to convey any sort of semantic information that they might want to change later. For instance, if the name of the journal changes, they won't want to change their DOI suffix because it doesn't have any information about that to begin with. Next bit is all information about the registration agencies has also been co-located here. Um, so the name of the game with a lot of these changes is co-location. So wanting all of the settings to be co-located as well as the actual DOI management itself. So we go here, we can check which registration agency we'd like to, which registration agency plugin we'd like to work with. Right now I have Crossref set up. Let's see the Crossref demo and that makes the most sense. Um, but all of these settings are co-located here. Automatic deposit is still functional and all of the settings are here along with some added context about the uh, username and the roles for setting those up. Go ahead and enable that. And then move on to the new DOI manager interface. So this interface here will be more or less the same regardless of which registration agency is used if a registration agency plugin is enabled at all. And this will be the same across all of the applications. So this was really done in an effort to unify the way that journal managers and editors can work with DOIs. Um, so a few things I'd like to highlight around this um, are the basics of DOI assignment, as well as some of the quality of life things. Um, so some of the first things that jump out are the red badges here. Um, these will usually show the top priority things that a journal manager would want to see when they come to the screen. And this includes things like whether items still need to be assigned as DOIs, once items have been published, whether they are, are unregistered, as well as if there are any errors in the registration process. Um, so we can filter things based on these types of things. So if you want to see all of the items that need DOIs, That includes everything because nothing has a DOI assigned at this time. There is an explanation for what all of these individual statuses mean, as well as the filters. Um, that can be updated or that can be viewed if you are looking here at a later time. It's also possible to filter by issues. And if you're using an issue-based workflow, can manage everything there. One of the other big improvements in terms of the workflow. For time, I didn't show an example of this in the pain point section in 3.3, but the ability to do bulk actions. So to paint a picture of it, imagine you had 300 items that you needed to assign DOIs or reassign or re-register. Previously, you had to tick all of these manually, and this was just a quirk of the design of the forms. We now have bulk actions, and this is where the heart of a lot of the functionality is. We filtered for the issue we want, we selected all, and now we'd like to assign some DOIs to these. And we can now see that the status of these moved from needs DOI to unregistered. DOIs can be edited under this expanded view. If you have more than one DOI for an item, if you are using galley DOIs, or if you're working with monographs and have more um, types of items that have DOIs, those can all be managed here. They can be edited here as well. And once you're ready, it can be deposited. So I'd also like to just take a moment to highlight this as the um, new type of suffix. Um, it is still more or less human readable. We tried to strike a balance between it being easy to uh, share and read without having, without being too long and still maintaining enough uh, unique possibilities. So the current pattern we have, there's a bit high of 1 billion different unique combinations that are possible per uh, prefix. Um, on the off chance that we do run into duplicate issues, a, a new suffix can always just be generated for that item, although that's quite unlikely.
before showing the deposit workflow, um, I want to show you how the automatic workflow works. So I gave a brief uh, example of that in the previous one. But I will show it for this as well. So I'll take an item here that has not yet been through the review process, but we'll pretend for a moment that this has been accepted for publication. Record that submission. And now it has moved into the copy editing stage. And if you recall, we've now set up DOIs to be assigned as soon as an item reaches the copy editing stage. So if we go over to the DOIs tab that loads up, we should now see that this item that we were just looking at now has a DOI assigned. This is something that was not previously possible and ends up causing um, a lot more headaches than it might initially appear. Not having DOI assignment tied to any semantic information about OJS metadata is a huge win for us and consequently creates fewer problems downstream for registration agencies like Crossref. Um, as a final bit, I'd like to just show the, regis the registration process. Um, one other pain point from previous versions was that when you were trying to submit multiple items to be registered, they would often time out and it was not always clear what the threshold for that was. Um, the registration process has been reworked to use a jobs based system. So for each of these items that we want to deposit, uh, they will now be queued in a jobs queue. And so if we go here, what that means is we go to deposit them. The UI feedback should be instant and they've been queued for deposit. And the XML generation and all of that slow process will happen one at a time. And as those are updated, if we refresh the page, we should see once those processes have finished that the deposit will be successful. Um, I won't make you watch that because that is a very long and slow process sometimes, which is the whole point of moving it into a background job. Um, and I believe that is all that I wanted to share with you today. Um, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Eric. We got it rolling um, in the end. So I think there's a question that's just come in. Um, yes. Um, from Tom. So yeah, this is about yes. the automatic assignment. Yes. Um, copy it. The way it works is copy edit the copy editing stage would be the first opportunity for things to be assigned. If, when it moves to the production stage, it could also be assigned. Um, so the idea is that this accommodates workflows where um, editors and journals either use or do not use the copy editing stage. But one way or another, it will have to go to either the copy editing stage or the production stage before being published. So the automatic assignment, will it will attempt the automatic assignment at both of those stages. And this is also true if the legacy pattern generation is also still in place, because obviously that would require an issue to be assigned. So it will first try at the copy editing stage. If it skips that, it will try at the production stage. And if it skips that, or if it's still not possible, it will try again on publication. So it will try as many times as is possible, but won't rewrite DOIs if they're already created. Uh, if that answers your question. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time. There's another question that's just come into the chat. And I think probably my question is around just where people can get information on upgrading to OJS 3.4 so they can take advantage of a lot of improvements that I think will just really help kind of ease a lot of those kind of pain points. Um, so yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put my email if anyone has any questions, and I will also link out to the uh, release uh, post about OJS 3.4. Um, I'll add that to the chat. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand over to um, Luis Montilla, who's been um, 
who's been leading things on the technical side. Sure. Oh, can you share my slides for me, please? Yes, I can indeed. Let me just grab those. Thank you. Oh, sorry, two seconds. Sorry, I've got these. Um... Um, I'm sorry, I just need to jump through to your slides. But yeah, if you want to go ahead and introduce your session, then sure. Yeah, let's. I start. will. I will. I'll catch up with you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Luis Montilla. I'm the technical community manager at Crossref, and today I will, I will be talking about well, giving a, a very basic introduction to the Crossref API, which we will start in a minute. Next one, yes, perfect. Next one, please. So this presentation will be about APIs, but more importantly, it will be about the possibilities that the community has to interact with the vast network of relationships between research objects, uh, which is what we call the research nexus. In more practical terms, uh, we are talking about metadata, which are the, basically the descriptors of, of research objects and how we can establish relationships between them. Next one, please. So uh, we make this metadata openly available via our APIs and our public data files, uh, enabling the uh, people and machines to incorporate it into their research tools and services. And at the same time, uh, we collect and we openly distribute this metadata as part of the ever-growing research nexus. It's safe to assume that not everybody understands what an API actually means. Uh, therefore, the purpose of this presentation is to provide a quick introduction to uh, the use of the Crossref API. So if we see the slide, we see that an, uh, an API is a software intermediary that allows two applications to talk to each other. And uh, APIs are often compared to a weather service facilitating communication between customers ordering items from a menu and the kitchen producing those items. Next one, please. So we make this metadata open through our REST API. Uh, you can visit the URL to access our documentation. I also shared the link in the chat and the presentation before. Um, and then you can use this to perform queries directly from your web browser. There is no registration required. Uh, Crossref, uh, once again, it's committed to providing an open and as anonymous as possible access to scholarly metadata. Uh, and keep uh, this URL at hand for the next examples, please. Um, however, we do have some recommendations and etiquette suggestions to follow if you wish to retrieve metadata. Uh, first, by adding your email address to your request, we can contact you in case of issues. Then additionally, we uh, redirect this request to a, a specific polite uh, pool of servers. These servers are generally more reliable because we can more easily protect them from misbehaving scripts in contrast with uh, fully anonymous requests. And then there is a third alternative, especially if you are using a REST API for a production service that require high predictability. 
uh, this option is to consider using our, our paid plus service, uh, which, in, which provides you with an authentication token that directs you to uh, uh, your request to a pool of servers that are extremely predictable. Next one, please. So for the specific examples I'm going to show you next, I'm going to use Postman, which is an API client. Uh, we don't endorse this app, but we acknowledge that it is widely used and it provides a set of functionalities that makes uh, metadata retrieval much easier. However, you can also execute these queries directly in your web browser once again. Um, in most cases, your browser will display these query results as a, in a JSON format. Uh, however, in some instances, you might need to install a, a browser ex extension. Next one, please. So before moving on, I would like to take a second to establish some basic vocabulary that, will, that, that you will encounter throughout these presentations. So the text that you see here that at the top represents a query. The first part that you see colored in yellow indicates the server. So this identifies the entity providing the service. And all of our cross ref related queries will share this common root. Then you have the endpoints. Um, this is a key term that we will use to identify the digital locations that receive a connection. And I will show you soon the other endpoints that we have available to the general community. And then finally, we have the, the parameters. Uh, you can identify them as being preceded by a question mark. And then they follow the notation of having a key and a value. So for example, in this specific exam example, you can see a query that has uh, the mail to parameter. Um, and these parts basically allow you to uh, specify resources uh, that you are retrieving and also to perform other actions, such as in this case, identifying yourself. Next one, please. So if we check the documentation, we'll find a list of different locations or the endpoints that our API contains uh, data of interest. In this presentation, I'll show you some basic examples of the data that you can retrieve using some of these. Uh, perhaps you noticed in the previous slide that I was using the funders endpoint, uh, but we have endpoints specifically for journals, works, uh, cross ref members, and several others. Next one, please. Uh, well, now let's explore some basic examples. Uh, we'll start with uh, funder to article relationships. Uh, this is interesting because funders do not automatically know when uh, the work that they have funded is published, and it, but it is also essential for reporting uh, on the impact of grants. And then finding this information can be challenging through other means uh, because often publishers, authors, and institution, institutions do not systematically report it. Next one, please. I'm going to, this is not going to be a live demo. This is going to be through, uh, done through screenshots. So as you can see here, uh, we include in the top part, the string that contains our server, the endpoint that I was mentioning before, the funders endpoint, um, and other parameters. In this specific case, I'd like to start with the, a very general search. So I include the mail to parameter uh, to make a polite request. And I add a query with the text German Research Foundation. Next one, please. So when you uh, submit this query, you will receive a, a, a status code. In this case, everything is it, OK. And then we, luckily, we can see how many items we are retrieving with this query, which I'm highlighting here. It, you can see that we are retrieving four results. Next one, please. So if we examine, hopefully it's a very, they have a good resolution, but if we examine the output in detail, we will notice that our query appears as part of the field alternative names and the organization that we are looking for appears on top. Uh, and then from here, we can take notice of the ID number, then you can use this to refine, refine our queries. Next one, please. So for example, if we use this ID as part of the, an additional path level in our funders endpoint, we can retrieve organization specific data. For example, here you, we can see that almost uh, 200,000 works have the, the uh, GRF as part of their re uh, funding organization. Next one, please. Thank you. Uh, so we can take a few seconds uh, in case you want to try this, or if, if, of course, if you're watching the recording, you can pause the presentation. So please visit this URL. You can scroll down to the funders section, click get, 
uh, please remember to add your email to the mail to field. And finally, include the any funding organization that you wish in the query field. Let's have a few seconds. Okay, next one, please. So this screenshot shows one possible result. Uh, please notice that you should get the, the status code 200 indicating that your query proceeded correctly. And uh, what it's called here, the response body contains your data. Next one, please. If you're pasting these queries directly in your web browser, uh, the search bar, it will likely look like this. Uh, the latest versions of Firefox and Chrome and several others should let you visualize this JSON file. I was doing some tests in Safari and then it, uh, it was one the one that required to install an, an extension. Consider this. Next one, thank you. So we can prove this output a little bit more by adding additional uh, field queries. Once again, these are listed in our documentation. Some of these accept text strings, some others are numbers, the others are Boolean expressions, meaning true or false. And of course, they can be combined in different ways. Next one, please. So for example, here, let's imagine that we are interested in knowing uh, how many of the selected organizations funded journal articles are publicly available. So in this case, we can add one filter that includes the type element. In this case, we are setting this to journal article. And we are also adding the filter that uh, asking if this contains a, a full text element and we are setting this to false. Next one, please. So you can try combining some of these. Uh, I'm showing you here the example that I just used. And then, of course, we can combine these fields more. So for example, we can also explore, uh, we can query the specific uh, awarded grants uh, that is available in the in the work list. Next one, please. Of we can also facet aggregate data so using uh, the facet fields. In this case, we can use this, uh, for example, to uh, aggregate the results in terms of the publication year. Next one. And here I'm showing the example in case you want to uh, replicate these examples. And well, with this slide, I will finish my presentation. Feel free to contact me. I will add my details in the chat. And hope this presentation was kind enough to anyone who was not aware of how to use an API before. Thank you very much. Um, Ruth, that was excellent. Thank you very much. And again, just to reiterate, we'll share the slides and a recording so that you can um, you can dig into this more. Um, Louise joined the, the team at Crossref a couple of months ago. Um, so if you enjoyed that demo, um, there'll be loads more to come um, in future and just help people get to, to grips with how to use the, the Crossref metadata. Um, Again, questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll pick those up. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to keep screen sharing, um, and I'm going to talk just really quickly about um, the, the work that we've been doing with the, um, with the data that's come from Retraction Watch. And Martin Eve is going to help me out whenever I get, when it, as and when I get stuck. Um, the... Just for, for context, in case you weren't aware, um, Crossref acquired and opened the Retraction Watch data um, in the middle of September. And um, I've linked to the blog post that, um, that describes that in more detail. The other thing I will do as well is for the context of why this information is important, et cetera, we covered in a community, um, um, in a community session, last month as well. So we'll share those, which will give you lots more context than we have time to, to do today. Um, there are lots of things that we know and expect our community to do with um, more comprehensive, complete information on retractions. Um, so 
we wanted to make the data available a you know in a very simple csv format but also via our labs api so that people can can start to get to grips with it early doors um so as i said as well as the um csv format we made the um or more more accurately martin made the data available via our labs api what i mean when i say the labs api is that it's a it's an environment where we test stuff out um adding new data and new representations of existing data and i think the main message of this presentation is it's where we'd love some feedback on how we are displaying and representing the the data there's a little um snapshot of it over to the the right hand side of this um this slide um as Luis mentioned, um, we asked you to use a mail to so your email to um, um, when you're accessing the the data, and the information is available as you can see via the um, via the works route in the in the labs API. Um, I've pulled some of the information out just to try to make it a little bit clearer. Martin, I'm happy again. You can talk to the pieces that I've missed, but. What sort of jumped out to me as someone who uses and is really interested in this is that we've got a couple of fields here. So we've got the, the ROAR ID of the Centre for Scientific Integrity, um, who are the, the folks behind the Retraction Watch data. So I think that's a that's a, a nice thing because, again, we've got ROAR identifiers. We want to be able to use those to uniquely and accurately identify um, institutions. Um, We've got, we're trying to be really clear about who made the, um, about who made the assertion that an article has been retracted, because in many instances, we've got um, a retraction being asserted by Retraction Watch that isn't currently reflected in the publisher metadata. And again, of course, we really hope and expect that that will, that that will change over time. Um, and we're thinking about how we model retractions um, full stop. Um, so I said, Martin implemented the workflow and crunched the Retraction Watch data to make it available via these routes. So thank you very much. But do you want to say more about the current implementation and the plans going ahead? Sure. So there are some limitations around what we've got at the moment. So for instance, it's not easy to do filters in our labs API system. So this should not be at this point a full replacement for the production API and, and you shouldn't expect the same, same stability or performance. What it does do though is let us test whether the information that we're representing is in a format that's of use to our community. So what I would urge is if you are someone who's been making use of the retraction watch data and you're thinking about using it in an API format, if you could have a go at using the labs API and seeing whether it meets your needs and giving us feedback on what's missing, what you need, what's there, what's good. Um, that would all be incredibly helpful for us in thinking about how we move this through to production um, at a later stage. Is that is that enough, Rachel? I'm not, I'm not sure what else I, I can add there at this point. I think that I think that that's more than enough. And we will, again, we'll pass on information on how you can get in touch with us about that. Um, and I know that lots of people have already. So I think that's really important. And again, please feel free to jump into the chat or Q&A um, and ask us questions about the data. And we'll also um, post a link to the, the webinar from a couple of weeks ago to do that. So we just want to flag this off. This is an area where we're really keen for um, for feedback. So, um, so, so do go ahead and give us that. Um, I am going to, so Martin, I'm going to leave you to your own devices for the next demo. So... Um, so you've been doing um, work to analyze the present preservation status of content registered by Crossref mem members. So um, I'll leave it to you to, to share your analysis and your, your thinking around that now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just bear with me a second while I uh, try to work out if I'm going to share the correct monitor or whether I'm going to show everyone all my emails. Um, 
Let's try that one. Have you got a presentation there, Rachel? Or present presentation and no emails. So perfect. That's, ah, that was a good guess then on the on the one of three commodities. Okay, thanks everyone. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about the state of digital preservation um, and a study that we conducted across seven million DOIs. Um, this is a really important aspect of Crossref's practice that sometimes goes under-remarked upon, which is that for Crossref to provide a stable linking service between different platforms, we need to know that material has been safely digitally preserved. Why is that? Because if the original source goes offline, where's a DOI going to end up pointing? If there's no digital preservation source to which we can redirect DOI, then actually the persistence of our URLs is limited to the lifetime of, of an original um, HTTP endpoint. So when you join Crossref, one of the conditions of membership is that you will make best efforts to ensure that your material is safely digitally preserved. But we don't know what proportion of scholarly objects assigned a DOI are actually adequately preserved in a recognized dark archiving system like Clocks, Locks, Portico, or even the Internet Archive. We don't really know how stable those preservation systems that underpin the persistence of these persistent identifiers is at the moment. We haven't yet had a mass extinction event of um, of DOIs or anything that has, has really used, caused us to use those systems en masse. We don't know which actors of our membership are behaving well on this theme. Who does digital preservation well and who does it badly? We don't even really know in the era of digital who should be doing this. Is it libraries? Is it publishers? Um, has that changed since the print era? Should it be both of those parties? And most importantly, perhaps um, with a slightly apocalyptic tone again, um, is it already too late? Is there a vast swathe of material that is not preserved that we're now going to struggle to get into some preservation mechanism um, at this late stage in the day? So I set about building an item level preservation database system that would allow us to iterate over a sample of DOIs and to figure out where these things are preserved. There's an existing system called the Keepers Registry that performs a similar function, but it doesn't have an API with open use that we could just use to query at scale um, a large number of DOIs. It also looks at the um, container level. So it will tell you this issue and this volume of this journal are preserved, not whether this DOI is preserved. So I had to build something that would translate between those layers. Um, but I built a system that incorporates the, the archives that you can see on this slide share. Um, so Carianiana, which is predominantly Southern Latin American uh, material, clocks, um, the controlled lots of copies, keep stuff safe archive. Um, Hathi Trust, um, Internet Archive, Locks, the more general version of Clocks, um, PKP's Private Locks Network, which is um, a system that PKP implemented to help open journal systems users ensure their material is safe, uh, Portico, another dark archive, um, and the Ocor Scholars Portal in Canada. I also needed some way of figuring out how to score members and how they're doing on digital preservation. Um, it's all very well to just say this is what's going on, but you need some way of ranking them and understanding the categorization. So I invented a scale because there is no standardized scale for digital preservation, where um, I gave gold medals to those that have 75% of their content digitally preserved in three or more recognized archives. Silver members in my scale are those with 50% of their content in two or more recognized archives. Bronze, 25% in one or more recognized archives. And unclassified, those that don't even meet the bronze categorization. So this is a scoring mechanism that works across two axes at the same time. It works across um, a percent preserved and, in a num and the number of archives that there are duplicate preservations in. So the very best in this would be to have all of your content in three or more of the recognized archives that, that I've been working with. Um, whereas the worst would be that you have less than 25%, not even in one archive. So what does it look like overall? I looked at 7 million DOIs from our sampling framework, and I found some pretty disturbing results in some ways, but perhaps um, not unexpected to those who've been looking at this for a while. So those in the real danger zone, the unclassified space with that less than 25% in one archive, we found that approximately um, 
33%, a third of all the content from members that I looked at was in that group. Um, meanwhile, bronze, which, you know, is, is okay. It's one archive with at least 25% in it made up um, approximately 57.7% of, of the members that we, we examined. Silver, again, it's a much smaller percent, 846 and only about 2% or so made it into that gold category, um, the uh, gold, gold star system at the top there. So there's a worrying preservation picture emerging across Crossref members that we need to perhaps do something about. I want to know also which types of members were behaving in, in what type of way. Um, there's a variety of ways in which you can classify the uh, size of Crossref members. Uh, you can do it by revenue. So this is a chart that shows uh, the breakdowns from those who have the very lowest levels of revenue at the top through to those that have the highest level at the bottom here. Um, and I think what you can see is the silver bar, which is perhaps the um, a key sign that people are doing things well with at least two archives backing the majority of their material increases substantially as we get down towards those with more resources. Perhaps heartening, though, even in though even among those with the lowest resources of our members, we do see that bronze bar where they are conducting at least one source of digital preservation for for some of their material is happening. So there is an awareness growing even among all types of publisher members that they should be doing digital preservation, and that it's something that does matter for their membership with Crossref. You can also do this by number of member deposits, but I think the picture again is clear. You can see this silver bar grows substantially as we get down to the bigger members who are doing more deposits. Um, the bronze bar, likewise, it stays, kind of goes down again at the end because the silver bar is eating it up, which is a good sign. But if you take bronze and silver collectively as a marker of who's doing preservation, apart from the very last bar of size, we've actually got a good, good level of growth as we go down there. But clearly, there are a number of smaller members here in this type of categorization who need us to, to have a chat with them about what they're doing for digital preservation, because at the moment, their material is not particularly safe. If you look at this on the works front, so that was looking at members as a whole, rather than looking at the number of actual works, though. So we found that approximately 60% were preserved at least once. So 60% of the content in that sample had some kind of backup system in place that could rescue it if, if the site went down. Um, but that left approximately 30% in our sample that seemed unpreserved um, and at serious risk, with an exclusion of 14% for being too recent, so they're in the current year, so they weren't yet in digital preservation archives, not being journal articles, or having insufficient date metadata for us to identify the source. So what are we going to do about this? Um, we've got a forthcoming peer-reviewed paper that sets out the, the data behind this and gives you the opportunity to read in more detail about the processes that we use to come to these conclusions. Uh, we've got some lay and easy read summaries of the preservation situation coming out as well so that we can start to spread the word um, even among non-technical users or less technically minded publishers. We'd like to conduct some direct member outreach. I think it's really important that we, in a non-confrontational way, get in touch with people who are not yet doing this well and work with them because it benefits everybody to have a secure and persistent linking system between our articles and other types of work that use DOIs. We're also working on an experimental system called Project OpSit, which um, I've just started work on in the last couple of weeks. Uh, this is a project that aims to integrate DOI deposit with um, ingestion into digital preservation archives and then tries to monitor an endpoint, so a, a DOI resolution point, to see whether it's gone down and to tell people this is a problem, you can now view it at this archive instead if you like. So uh, if you Google for that project of SIT and Crossref, you should find the specification document and call for um, call for comment on that. So if you want to feedback on that, um, it's not too late. For, um, still get in touch. And the full charts and data set behind these findings are available at the website there, the hyphen vault.fly.dev. Thank you very much. I hope that was of interest.
Excellent. Thank you. So I think there's already interest in going to zoom in on the the charts and to be able to, to find more information on that. So um, Rhiannon, do um, go and check out the link that Luis has just posted in the um, in the chat. And again, if you've got follow up questions. Um, let Martin know. Thank you. Um, and Martin, are you hanging around for sort of the next sort of 15, 20 minutes? So if you're mulling sure. over a question, um, he'll still be he'll still be here if you want it um, answered more more live. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's 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 a really interesting analysis, and there's definitely follow up actions that we can take both as cross ref and as and as community, I expect. Um, and there's a question just um, jumped into the um, into the Q and A as well. I think that the um, this is because of bad mess data on locations. Um, so the question was that there are cities sometimes or regions in the location or what we've called country because it's supposed to be a country field, but sometimes people put more detailed information in there. So. Um, it's the best, you know, I could spend a lot of time clearing up that data and going through, but with um, the 7 million records filtering in, um, you just have to basically take it with a pinch of salt, the, the location fields in there, and we've done our best on location. Cool. Thank you. Um, so the final presentation stroke demo for this session is... Um, DOIs for for static sites. Um, so Aisha Data from our um, from our labs team is going to give us a quick demo, an overview of the static site um, identifier generator using the Crossref website as a as a test case. Um, I appreciate a semi live demo of stuff that is in active development, but again, I think you've you've put some safeguard you've you've put some safeguards in place as well. So I'll hand over to you to to talk us through it. All right, great. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can see the slide deck. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just kind of talk about this a little bit and then do a video demo because some of the processing takes a little time and that's boring. Um, so basically, I am going to give a demo of this lovely wordy piece of software called Static Page ID Generator because I couldn't think of a better name. Um, it is developed to help create PIDs such as DOIs for blogs or other research materials built by static site generators such as Hugo, Jekyll, or others. Currently, the software is being tested with Hugo. Uh, we decided to develop the software because increasingly at Crossref, we are seeing a need to develop permanent URLs for our own use on our website and could see a use for the wider community as well. Um, our website is built using Hugo. Uh, the software can track a Git repository of the static site in question. Um, and if a user specifies a path, it'll start focusing on any files under that path. It'll generate unique IDs for the files that a user wants tracked. And if the user is a Crossref member, It'll build the XML deposit files, deposits the metadata for the files into Crossref, registers the DOIs, and adds the DOI back to the file in question. If you're not a Crossref member for now, basically all it'll do is features one and two, which is tracks the files and generates a unique ID. But we are developing a plugin architecture so that it can accommodate other use cases and other registration agencies and also other types of uh, unique IDs that you'd want. Um, so I'm going to start with the end result of this, which is that here is an example page of the test version of Crossref, of the Crossref site. Um, so I basically just created this very lovely test page and ran the script against it, which then deposited this uh, 
this metadata into Crossref, which you can see in the API. And here's the DOI for that. And it can also then be used in downstream applications such as, such as the metadata search, where if you did a search on this, you would find the same um, article. And if I go back to it, here is the file. Um, so basically, I'm going to show you how show you two ways of how I use the script. First is in the GitLab repository, which contains the um, test version of the site. Um, and then the second is the command line version. So in this repository, we run the script using GitLab's continuous integration setup. And if you use, if you have a repository that's in GitHub, it has a similar process. So I first ran in the GitLab repository a set of process that creates a config file which contains the information. Let me, I have it queued up in my video. So here's the config file. Um, so here you see that um, I'm asking the script to track everything in the repo. Uh, I've put in a test DOI prefix. Um, I have this crazy long domain, which is basically just the test version of the site's domain. I'm specifying that I want an ID type of DOI and the JSON file basically contains all of the information of the files that are being tracked. And now I'm gonna play the video. Not sure how much time we have, so I'll check in again after I've finished the Git the repository part of the demo. And if we have more time, I can also show you the CLI part of the cool. demo. Yeah, I think we're okay for time. Okay, cool. The JSON file contains- Can you all hear this? All of the information for the yep. file. To start tracking a file, I created this um, file, which is new, um, and basically added some front matter. So it includes some of, uh, some basically labels that is recognized by the Hugo site. And also crucially, I added this X version tag, which basically tells the script to start tracking it. The um, value to the right of X version is in semantic version um, style. So basically the first zero tells you that this is the major version, the next one is the minor version, and this is the patch. So um, the script looks for a default version of 0.0.0, .0, and it knows that this is a new file and to begin tracking it. So once I push this file, um, I start to get a process that runs this job, and it pulls down a Docker image and um, runs the script, essentially. So we are mentioning giving some credentials for it. And then we are also saying that it needs to check the um, repository over here that the submission type is Crossref and that it um, needs some more submission information or deposit information for the script to deposit the metadata that you will be um, using eventually. So what it does is it adds the file information to the JSON file, it deposits the XML, and then it also creates a DOI and adds it back to this file. And you know that all is well because the job has succeeded. The job has run successfully. We can check the page back again, and we can see that a DOI has been added to this page. Um, and we can also see that once the site has been deployed to production, uh, if we click on this um, and go to this DOI, it takes you to the site, uh, to the page that's um, been deployed to production. So this is basically how you would run it um, in continuous integration on a GitLab hosted repository. Um, there is a similar um, operation that you would do if it was um, hosted on GitHub as well, because GitHub also has a continuous integration um, setup. For running the script on the command line, I have cloned the static page ID script generator onto my computer. And um, I have 
installed all of the requirements in a virtual environment. And in another terminal, I have my static site repository. I first need to initialize the repository for the script, which generates two files that helps the script track the, track the versioned files. So to run the um, initialize script, I run this command, which requires a few arguments that tells the script a few things. It tells the script that you to track this particular repository, um, to track the path in the repository, which is content. It gives it the production domain that it needs to generate a DOI and a DOI prefix. So once that is generated, it will create two files. This is to track the files, and this is essentially contains all the values needed to generate DOIs. So I already ran this, and so there is a config.yaml and a pid.json, which looks like this for the config.yaml file, and it's just an empty pid.json file because I haven't run anything. So in order to let the script know that I want it to be tracked, I add this particular tag with its value in the front matter. So I tell the script that I want this to be versioned and I add an X version tag to it. And I follow the semantic versioning style, which is major, major version, minor version, and patch version. Um, so currently we have functionality that looks to see if the version number is 0 .0 .0, 0.0.0 and it's uh, belonging to this tag, and then it will start to run all that's needed. Run the script um, after telling uh, the script which files we want to be tagged. And we do this by, again, specifying the repository path. We're telling it that the submission type is going to be crossref because we're going to deposit this into crossref. And then we have another file that tells the sub submission scripts some more information to make the submissions successful. So it's going to generate some PIDs. Um, it's going to track the files. And it has now submitted the file. And now it's going to check the DOI registration status. Once it runs it, it checks the DOIs. And then it adds the DOI back to the file, which you can see over here. So now we know that this file has a DOI and can be accessed once this once the website has been deployed to production. Um, so that's how you would run it in the CLI. I also wanted to show you what it would look like if I at checked the DOI from the command line. So um, this is a page that has actually been deployed uh, to production, which is the test uh, website that I have. So if I copy and pay the, paste this or just follow the link, this will um, show me the page that has been deployed. And as you can see, the DOI is listed on the page here. And this is all of my test text, of course. Um, so that's uh, basically the demo for this. Thank you for bearing with the video and the extraneous sounds. Um, future steps include that it's still an active development and we still have a ways to go, including incorporating it into the Crosstalk website workflow. Uh, I, I'm planning on converting this into a library um, and allowing plugin functionality so that it can accommodate other types of use cases as well. And I'm happy to hear uh, more feedback from all of you and you know see how we can collaborate better on this. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you very much. It all worked very, um, very smoothly. And um, there are a couple of hopefully um, quick questions um in the q a if you want to call those up um cool. or i can just yeah is it the uh do you have thoughts is that the one yeah the thoughts about the 
um, on the archiving of the final rendered static page images, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question. I haven't really thought about it, but um, yeah, that is that is super interesting. And also, yeah, we could also talk to Martin Eve about possibly looking into how to preserve this. And so that's a that's a nice tie in into that for sure. Um, and then there's a second question about, um, or actually, Martin, I'll let you jump. I've seen you've unmuted. Let's let's take a bit more time on that question. Um, I was just going to draw attention, actually, to Martin Fenner's work that was uh, mentioned earlier today, I think, in a different session um, that's been looking into the preservation of blogs and static sites. So um, there's already some experimentation around the, the preservation function here. But you're right, we've, we've got an ideal point now if we're assigning a, a DOI to these items to think about how we might get them into an archive so that we know that the stuff is preserved at that point because obviously the, if if we just open the floodgates and say everyone can have a DOI for this content but they're unaware that there's that preservation responsibility then we're in quite a difficult position and then there's another question um Asia um how does this tool handle multiple resolution? Yeah, again, a very good question. Um, currently, it's still very much in active development, so we should definitely talk more about all of those types of use cases. Great. Um, I will give people a few more minutes. Um, I. Um, the next session will start on the R. Um, I'll give people a few more minutes in case there are any final questions, um, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to say thanks to all of our fantastic presenters and also for um, for your really good questions. Um, I hope this gives a flavour of the, um, the variety um, and even just a small subject subset of the things that we're working about and thinking about across the various teams. Um, this has just posted the link to the next session, which is um, a discussion among Crossref staff and other members of our community on what we still need to build a research nexus. So I hope we hope that you'll that you'll also join us for that. Yeah, if you want to Take a few minutes, ask any further questions, or go and get a cup of tea, coffee, glass of water. Um, this is your chance. Um, but thank you again. Okay, I can see people starting to um, starting to to head off and take up the opportunity of a of a coffee again. Um, there are lots of mechanisms by which you can you you know by which you can get in touch with Crossref. Um, our community forum is a great um, resource for that as well. So this isn't kind of the end of the opportunity to to ask questions and um, and to find out more information. Um, and obviously we'll we'll follow up by posting the video and a link to the the slides in the in the coming days once we've pulled everything together. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks again, and we hope to see you in the next session.